I'm Meredith Lee. I used to be vegan. Now I'm a butcher, a farmer, a cook, and an author. I've written a book to try and help people not only understand the system as a whole, but also see that we can eat well, and we can eat ethically, and we can make a difference. This is vibrant life. It includes death. It's not either a big back or nothing. There's this potentially really hopeful spot that we can come to in the middle. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Two Guys in a Cooler Show. We're taking a break from the kitchen, and we are talking to uh, really a mom, a teacher, a chef, a butcher, a published author, a farmer, can I continue, a salumist, a <laughs> zymologist, Meredith Lee. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having Would me. Would you consider yourself a zymologist? <laughs> I don't know what that word means, I must confess. It, a zymologist is the study of fermented foods and the bacterial oh. processes. Oh, definitely. That definitely describes me. Absolutely. Wow, thanks for teaching me that. I'll have to add it to my resume. Zymologist. All right, so welcome back to the country. You've been in Denmark here for uh, a couple days here last week, if I recall, right? Yeah, five days. Last week I was in Copenhagen for the MAD Symposium. It's amazing. I mean, for folks who don't know what the MAD Symposium is, it's kind of, somebody recently described it in Forbes magazine as like the G20 of the food world. So it's like the, it's like a summit of, uh, I think it was about 600 people from 60 countries. And we're talking like Michelin star chefs and, you know, food hub activists and writers and I don't know, all kinds of people who think about food more than most people do every day of their lives. And they're all coming to these tents on this little harbor island near Copenhagen and just talking about the issues for a couple of days. There's all, there's a lot of inherent complexity in working in food scene, you know, like, and, and the YouTube channels and the books and whatever that we all do can kind of make it seem easier than it really is sometimes. <laughs> and so I really love like really honing in on the complexity and teaching towards the complexity and, and going there with people when they endeavor to ferment their first food or, you know, start their farm, like they're going to run into all these questions and all these complexities and intricacies that quite honestly, nobody's figured out yet, you know? And, and so it's like, that's so exciting to me. I work with an organization here locally in, in North Carolina, where I'm from, that addresses like issues of poverty and food access and a lot of questions about that, you know, like, are we part of the solution? Are we part of the problem in terms of like getting good food to everybody who needs it and wants it? And, you know, and really that's everybody. I, uh, before we, before we move on, I just got to say in regards to the Matt symposium, I particularly enjoyed, uh, Jay Fi's, uh, crab omelet. Oh. Wasn't that cool? Did you watch it? Of live? course. Yeah. People should know that they can go and get some of the live talks, like check them out. Um, yeah, JF was like, she brought us so much joy, you know, and, and and she was the first session in the tent on the very first day. Yeah. And I mean, everyone in that tent was smiling and laughing <laughs> and on their feet, you know. So um, the other thing to check out when they do come online is um, definitely check out the conversation between Kim Severson and Wade Davis, former NFL player, and Lisa Marie Donovan, who just recently won a, a James Beard Award for an article on the Me Too movement in the restaurant industry. They're talking about social equity in the restaurant world. It was really powerful. Nice. The other one is Linda Opes, who is a, is a movie producer in L.A., really brought the house down with her perspective on, um, you know, social equity in, in Hollywood and how it relates to, to the restaurant world. Um, so definitely, you know, check out MAD. Um, they have a lot of stuff from past symposiums on their website, and, and I'm sure the stuff that they're going to be posting from the most recent symposium will be really, really rich for for the viewers of your channel. Oh, it's extraordinary. You, and anybody who wants to go check it out, you can check it out at madfeed.co and then just click on the read and watch uh, tab at the top and then you'll get a list of uh, right. different options. It's really fantastic. Let's yeah. let's talk about uh, modern homesteading. That's such a popular topic today. It's something that you're heavily yeah. involved in. And there's a lot of people who, who want freedom from um, an oppressive work, an oppressive lifestyle, an oppressive government. And, and so they're looking for options to say, you know what, do I need 150 acres in order to start homesteading? What do you, what would you say? Right. Well, I would say that our food system is just messed up enough to where you can start taking control of things that you probably can't even imagine, even if you live in, you know, a high rise apartment building in Manhattan. Um, 
So whether it's like through fermentation or, yeah, having chickens in a backyard that you might possess, you know, you can take steps right away, no matter where you are, to start homesteading on some scale. Because really so much of our food is so outsourced and so out of our hands um, that really there's anything anybody can do to take that back. Your experience of food is going to be richer if you're eating food when it's vital. You know what I mean? So a tomato that's been picked out of season and shipped a far distance that doesn't have a lot of nutrient density is also not going to have a lot of flavor. The reason that we are prioritizing food less is because we're enjoying it less. You know, and if you don't enjoy something very much, then why would you prioritize it? You know yeah. what I mean? It's just something you need to get through your day at that point. Um, and so I think when people, that's why people are so surprised when they garden for the first time and they eat something that is, you know, hasn't been packaged and shipped and stamped and it hasn't traveled long distances and it hasn't been forced to, you know, through its life. Yeah. Um, and they, they can taste the difference and they feel drawn to it and they feel empowered by it. Um, and that, you know, there's, there's real tangible reason for that. You know, but I mean, I've lived in, I've lived in apartments since I started, you know, I started farming almost 20 years ago now, but I don't own my own land anymore. And when I was in transition from having my own land, I was living in, you know, rental houses in Asheville and I had a container garden on my, on my deck, you know, cucumbers growing on the, on the banister of the, of the deck and crates full of lettuces and um, peppers and pots and you know we ate we didn't eat all of our food from our little deck garden but we definitely supplemented um, and and it was great which is your uh, animal of choice I guess if you had to if you had to pick one <laughs> for ho for homesteading probably Would a be... duck really the duck yeah I love why, ducks why I the love, duck I love their meat I love their eggs um, I love the benefits they provide in the garden. They eat bugs, but they don't scratch, you know, so they're not going to tear it up the way chickens do. I mean, you do have to be careful about where they tread, but, but um, they just seem like really nice companions um, for, for my lifestyle and for the garden that I have. Uh, people, people are usually really comfortable with chickens starting yeah. out, you know, um, and chickens are easy to raise and um, really rewarding, you know, especially if you have kids. Um, so I definitely, I, I think that that's a nice go-to for people, but any kind of, you know, bird, I think is really nice. You know, qu quail is a good idea. Like, um, partridge, some people get into or guinea fowl as well. Um, and ducks are kind of in that category. But once you get into like things with four legs, you really do need to have a little bit more of a land holding. Let's talk about fermentation. Um, what's your okay. favorite? What's your favorite ferment? Oh, veggie ferments have got to be my oldest love, you know. But I mean, at the same time, what's my favorite right now? Right now, I guess yeah. probably working working with Koji. There's a lot of folks that that have lived a unhealthy lifestyle and they want to go into something in which they're. Their, their gut is is getting what it's supposed to be getting. And uh, the easiest right. way for them to do it is obviously fermentation. But fermentation can be overwhelming depending on, you know, who you talk to. And so what would you recommend as, as just an easy go-to? This is a great beginner ferment for anyone out there looking to get into fermentation. Oh, sauerkraut. or any And riffing off of sauerkraut and the basic principles of sauerkraut to make any vegetable ferment from your garden or from veggies you get at the farmer's market. Nice. Um, you know, rule of thumb per five pounds of veggies, you need like three tablespoons of sea salt and that's all you really need, you know, to, to get it done. And I mean, I've got recipes on my website and then I'll, I have also have a video on YouTube via living web farms called introduction to vegetable fermentation, which I think is pretty accessible. You know, if you endeavor to learn about it to where you understand, I mean, even somebody who doesn't like science, if you understand the principles like, okay, this is an anaerobic process. Well, what does that mean? It means it happens in the absence of oxygen, which means that all the vegetables need to be in a brine, you know, submerged in liquid in order for the process to happen properly. You know what I mean? And just knowing that information prevents all kinds of processing errors that people often encounter when they're fermenting for their very first time. You know, I mean, the first time I made sauerkraut, it failed, <laughs> you know? But I mean, I think that there's like the issue is many fold. It's like people don't people don't trust themselves anymore because we've been taught that we're not supposed to, you know, we've been taught that we're supposed to outsource everything. We're supposed to depend on other people. You know what I mean? We've also been taught to be afraid of bacteria, not that bacteria can also be beneficial to us. 
You know what I mean? And we've also just like, we have like a really big aversion to failure. Like if we fail, we don't want to try again. And it almost seems to take a special personality these days for someone to be like, oh man, that didn't work. I'm going to try it again. You know? But, um, but that's very much like part of this world, part of homesteading, part of farming, part of fermenting is like, yeah, we're, we're figuring it out. We're creating, we're inventing, you know, and part of that process is, is screwing up. What do you think about Kvass? Oh, I like Kvass. I don't make a lot of beverages. Like kombucha, um, things I, like that? I make kombucha. I, I mean, I kind of make kombucha in a really lazy way. I'm like, oh, there's my kombucha. I forgot about it. You know, <laughs> like, you know, and then I'll start another batch or something that day. But, but um, yeah, I, I really like Kvass, but I don't. I don't make it. There's something so, in, I don't know, the fizzy earthiness of the beet that's uh-huh. not really sweet. It's just a, a neat drink. I don't know. Something about Kvass. It's so neat. Same with like water kefir and those kinds of like any any probiotic, like effervescent beverage. It's so rewarding and it's so refreshing. Exactly. I was like, um, people that I know have like the habit of drinking a, a decent amount of beer Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like if they if they adopt like a water kefir you know hobby or making kvass or something like they find that like really what they're craving is just like a refreshing fizzy beverage you know yeah. if they have the kefir and the kvass instead it's like oh I'm less likely to crack open a beer and I'm more likely to drink this you know helpful beverage that I've produced myself you know you're into charcuterie mm-hmm. uh, you, but you were you were it, were you, were, you, were you a chef originally? Is that is that kind of what you went to school for? Did, you know, your original profession? No. No, my original profession is farmer. I went to school for agriculture. Okay. And then you um, became a chef. So, yeah, I actually, so I had a farm for about 12 years, um, and I was raising kind of A to Z organic vegetables, cut flowers, and pasture-raised meats. Um, and then we realized that we were sort of making – making a better living off of the meats, the pastured meats, than we were off the vegetables. So we started to specialize. And then we realized that we were paying a lot of money every year to our processors. So like our slaughterhouse um, sausage maker. And so we decided to open our own butcher shop. And so that was really like, we, we had a restaurant attached to the butcher shop. And so that was really like, I learned and came into that business as sort of a necessity like, and scaling up my farm. Nice. Um, but then I, you know, in learning like some of the post-production processing um, things that, you know, because at the point that I opened the butcher shop, I was then sourcing meat from other producers as well. And I was able to see like patterns and the quality of the meat or the quality of the fat, like what was the production scenario there. And, you know, and then learning charcuterie and the whole ar- artisanal side of further processing the meat, it just really brought everything full circle for me. You know, and I started to, to see like some of the ways that we are maybe not we maybe haven't necessarily perfected like raising animals on grass or, you know, we, we haven't come up with a consistent product, you know, um, when it comes to like a heritage pasture fed hog. And, and so that's when I decided to write my book and sort of like take a, you know, zoomed out, look at the meat supply chain, like what are we doing really great in terms of developing like a new way of getting meat on our plate and what are we still sort of lacking in you know what I mean? And oh, so yeah. that's kind of what my work has become focused on. It's like, you know, what is the purpose of charcuterie? What makes quality meat and fat? Like, why is it important to learn butchery? Why does it matter? You know, um, how do you support farmers? How do we make the system work? Um, is kind of kind of the, the big rabbit hole that I've been going down professionally for the last five or so years. And that brings me to, you know, that brings me to charcuterie. I mean, you know, obviously that's an enormous ancient practice of you know curing and preserving meat what is your go-to project when it comes to charcuterie are you more salumi or are you more salami (laughs) um well i mean i guess when i'm approaching charcuterie now is i'm working on recipe development so i'm looking to take tradition and evolve it towards modern you know technique or flavor um keeping it exciting for people because i'm teaching intensive charcuterie workshops all around the country I'm always wanting to have new products for people and always wanting to have new recipes or things for them to try. And so I do a combination of whole muscle, you know, um, charcuterie as well as um, making inventive salamis on a pretty regular basis. Um, I also, I'm also producing things that my family likes to eat. So we make a lot of bacon. Um, we make our own lunch meats when we can. So we're making like smoked hams to slice for the kids' lunches or, um, you know, all manner of different 
of different de- deli meats, roast beef, stuff like that, you know, um, because I got four kids in my house going to school every day, you know, so. I, I was intrigued in your in your newest book. You have a recipe that chili mustard pickled celery salami. <laughs> that is the craziest salami. I can't even believe I put it in the book. Did you did you make it? That's the next recipe I, I plan on making. I've actually not met anybody who actually tried it yet. Well, there's a good chance I'm going to make it and, and put it on YouTube. And so you'll be able to see the process <laughs> from my perspective. <laughs> All right. So you, in order to make salami, in order to make, you know, any kind of uh, cured meats um, uh-huh. safely, you, you need a chamber or you need the correct environment. Most people have to right. build some sort of a chamber. Uh, if I right. recall correctly, you use an old refrigerator, right? I do. Yep. And you, you just have one or do you have like many refrigerators that you I have? I have two at home and one at work, so three total. Okay. Um, but really, I, I I mostly use the ones at home more because the closer an eye you keep on it, you know, the better the better it is. Are your kids um, into it? Do they go in there and check and smell and hey, you know, do they love that? No, not really. They're a little bit intrigued by it, but they're mostly freaked out. I mean, the farthest I've gotten them to come yet is like helping me mix and grind. Oh sure. You know and and stuff the sausages and even then they're like whoa this is weird i know the process of of charcuterie is uh, at least it was for me incredibly uh, overwhelming because you know going from making sausage to going from curing meat um mm-hmm. when you're just looking at it from an outside perspective and you don't know a whole lot about it yeah. you see, you seem to think wow there's not only is there a lot of science but there's a lot of processes there's a lot of equipment and there's a lot of steps that go along mm-hmm. to it uh, but after doing it for a, for a little while now myself, I can personally say that it's actually not that complicated. Would you agree with that statement? Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I'm doing with my classes and with my book is trying to open source it and trying to teach towards the patterns that develop in proce- in meat processing. So say you have, um, say you want to make a, a sausage with uh, garlic and rosemary. All okay. right. So you, you can come to one of my classes and we can take that recipe. We'll, we'll make that recipe together. I'll teach you the ratios to make that that garlic rosemary sausage. And then say you want to turn it into a pate. What do you need to do? You know, take the same ingredients. How do you turn it into a pate? Okay, now what do you want to turn it into a dry cured salami? What are you going to do differently? And so people can really see that it's just about affecting ratio. Same as if you wanted to change a pancake into a crepe. You know what I mean? Like it's just a different ratio of the ingredients in proportion to each other in order to create different textures or, you know, develop different platforms for, you know, the biological process of fermentation, for example. And the way charcuterie is traditionally taught is towards like, oh, here's what's done in Italy and here's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so you can get really lost in all these daunting like traditional names and what's the equivalent in France to this thing that's in Italy and I've got to read the recipe. If I don't read the recipe, I'll get it wrong. And then there's an ingredient in the recipe that you don't understand why it's there. You know what I mean? And so I'm kind of, what I'm trying to do with my education and my books is like take all of that and amass as much as I can. I mean, there's, there's certainly charcuterie that I've never heard of before. You know, that's how vast of a world it is. But take all that process and tradition that I do know about and say, okay, here's how I can distill this a little bit and yeah. help you understand like scientifically as well as practically like why are you putting dry milk powder in your mortadella? What, what mm-hmm. does it mean? You know, what is the difference between drying and fermenting? Um, and so I think, you know, the, the hope is that people will be able to come at it a little less afraid and a little less overwhelmed. You know, and we live in a world uh, today in which n- nitrites and nitrates aren't entirely understood. There's a lot of misinformation out there. And so people right. kind of hang on to the really, really, you know, bad things that they hear from sources, but they don't consider the entire process. And um, your perspective on cultures is to allow the natural cultures within the chamber that you're, or the room that you're you're fermenting uh, to, to right. grow within the meat. How does somebody know what they have? Well, they don't. So using nitrates in meat, I always encourage people to use some form of nitrite, whether it's naturally derived from a celery product or whether it's synthetically derived from cures one and two. You've got to use it in products. You know, as far as what we know now, you should use it in products that are either never going to be cooked or they're going to be cold smoked. Sure. Um, 
because just be, because of the dangers of botulism. That being said, there is research out there showing that the synergistic processes of fermentation and curing that are happening because of microorganisms in the meat anyway might set the stage to where botulism can't thrive. You know nice. what I mean? And so, again, like there are things that our science can't measure. So that's one thing that I put out there to my students. That being said, it takes a half a microgram of botulism to kill you. When it comes to, you know, beneficial starter cultures, um, I'm not super interested in creating or teaching systems that require us to depend on big pharmaceutical companies or other providers in order to make the charcuterie that we want to make. Sure. If we know the science behind fermentation, we know that the fermentative bacteria are u- ubiquitous in our environment. We're talking about the same genera of bacteria that are in your jar of sauerkraut, lactobacillus, pediococcus, those, those critters are everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the, the, the situation is if you provide the proper environment for them to thrive and you do all the right things you need to do to exclude the bad guys, that you're going to get them in there and you're going to get fermentation happening just fine. You know, you may find in the process of, you know, trying to pursue pure charcuterie, which is what I call it, you know, that you, you have setbacks. For example, recently I cleaned the inside of my cabinet because I had cured something with a bunch of black pepper on it and that's black pepper all over the place. And so I wiped it out and I found that on my next go, fermentation was happening so much slower. Of course. Right? So anytime you go in and you wipe things down, you're resetting, you know, the life, the life in there. And it's, it's pretty fascinating, you know, but, but I guess, I guess to sum it up, like, I don't discourage people from using bot starter cultures in order to ensure that they have the right, you know, bacteria inside their sausages, especially if they're just starting out, you know, but I think as you, as you grow in your practice and as you start to understand the science of it, and you can, based on the science that you know, affect the process um, through your technique or through through your recipe design, um, then you can probably forge ahead without starter cultures and still have successful processing. I agree completely. And I think that the more someone does it, the more confident they become in it, you know? Right. Exactly. And, and, it, and it's interesting because, you know, from from one, you know, copa hanging or, or one ham hanging in your in your chamber... Uh, you're you're like you said you're you're developing a colony within your chamber and eventually exactly. you don't have to spray penicillium algae events eventually you don't have to you know because it's already there that's right it just wants to thrive yeah and like if you're worried about it like you can take like you can take a casing off of a salami that you've made successfully and you can soak it you know yeah. in some lukewarm water put that water in a spray bottle and spray that on the inside of your cabinet you're going to be re-inoculating you know, with with the right kind of, of flora in that case, you know, and it doesn't require necessarily buying in yep. a starter culture. Um, the other thing is that you got to recognize that the starter cultures, by and large, have been developed for the industry. So they've been developed for mass-produced commercialization of charcuterie, which is really not what the home practitioner needs to worry about, you know. You're not trying to produce... Um, you know, 10,000 salami chubs in a very short amount of time so that you can fill your order at the supermarket. You know what I'm saying? What you're trying to do is produce old world slow food, like one of the slowest foods on earth. And so you don't need to ferment at super high temperatures. You don't need to inoculate with a bacteria that can ferment at 100 degrees. You know, you don't need extra milk sugar to then slow down fermentation and add, you know, a sweet flavor that will counteract that super fast fermentation process. Like you just don't have to worry about all that stuff. And so, and so it, it's not important to buy it. And it's also not important either to use the entire package of $15 freeze dried bacteria, you know, per recipe as some practitioners have recommended, because what we're doing is inoculating. You really need like a half a teaspoon and then you can keep that starter culture in the freezer indefinitely. I know that the uh, the and the end result is extraordinary. The end result is a product that just doesn't even compare to store bought uh, products. It just doesn't even compare. No, it doesn't. I mean, there's there's biological processes going on in a slowly cured like old world product that are never even touched in a mass produced scenario because some of these cultures and some of these 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 organisms only do their work at very low pHs and in very very you know lengthy amounts of time. Yeah. And so you'll never get the flavor, you know, that you want or that you think 
you know, or associate with old world charcuterie from a product that's designed, you know, to meet, you know, mass demand. So somebody builds a chamber. Somebody says, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot. And, uh, and building a chamber is actually really, you know, at first I thought, wow, this is going to be crazy. It's actually incredibly easy. It just so easy. What is it? Control the temperature, control the humidity, and that's it. <laughs> that's yeah, really you need an it. insulated box. <laughs> you need an insulated box where you can affect the temperature and humidity. And people use coolers yep. for this. You know, people even use styrofoam coolers that you bought from, you know, the supermarket. So somebody builds a chamber, but they say, you know what, I'm, this is only going to be for charcuterie. What if, I, what if one day, you know, I, I couldn't imagine this, but what if they say, I get bored with charcuterie? Tell me what you think about <laughs> these three other options for using a charcuterie chamber, a, a chamber. So um, cheese making. Yes, definitely. Do you make cheese? I don't um, on the level that I would like to, but that's a that's on on the bucket list to to be making aged cheeses. And so it's you could use the same because it's the exact same process. It's just a different temperature, different humidity, different bacteria, but uh, different bacteria. Cheese. Yeah, but a lot of the same principles. For sure. Same principles. Um, aging beef. Yes, you could. You could. Use your if you didn't want to be using it for charcuterie, you could be using your your fridge for aging beef. So drop sure. the drop the temp, raise the humidity, increase the airflow. Yep. You now have yep. you know really great thirty day age. You got a funky you know it's a process of, of, of bacteria also breaks it down. Um, mm -hmm. This is another one because you know I I'm a huge fan of of mushrooms. I just love mushrooms. Cultivating uh -huh. mushrooms in your dry yeah, in your totally. chamber. That's a great idea. Have uh, Have you gone down that road of mycology? Have you Have you touched I've, it yet? Yeah, I've grown some mushrooms. I've done some of the easy ones like oysters and shiitake. Um, it's very rewarding, um, and I'm friends with a lot of mushroom geeks who have way more knowledge than I do, and I, I think that they are like some of the most intelligent and um, adventurous people that I know. Um, and there's so much power that that fungus has to what, remediate soils, uh, remediate waste in our environment. And um, I don't know, they're just, mushrooms are just fascinating, powerful organisms. The very first time, uh, this was probably five or six years ago, when I thought, you know what, I know how to, I know how to plant a tomato and <laughs> I can definitely plant lettuce and, and harvest lettuce. Mushrooms should uh -huh. be no problem. <laughs> wow, what an extraordinary, I was wrong by the way. It's, a, yeah, it's pretty involved. It's not quite the same, but incredibly rewarding. It is, the, it is the neatest thing to watch the mycelium do what it does and fruit and just spore. And it's probably one of the coolest fields in my opinion that, uh, yeah. that comes to, uh, that, that I think everybody should at least consider as a, as a, as a project when they're doing homesteading. I think it's fascinating. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's four options. You can make salami, you can grow mushrooms, you can make cheese, you can definitely dry aged beef in a chamber. So if those of you who are concerned about, you know, this is going to be only for charcuterie, you got options. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, there you go. Have you ever dry aged beef yourself? I have. Um, I did it when in my, in my shop when I had, had a shop and um, had good success. It was fine. I, you know, for home practitioners, I definitely, there's a, there was a lot of hype about dry aging individual steaks right. for a while, which I definitely don't recommend. I think if you're going to be dry aging, you need to be using subprimals. Um, and then, I mean, there's not a whole lot of scientific research about like how, you know, how much adjusting the temperature is going to affect the aging process, but just in general being like above freezing and below 40, degrees right. Fahrenheit and then having like a higher, you know, humidity than in, in your typical refrigerator is, is the process. Um, and then based on, you know, what you're trying to do or the size of the cut, you know, you're going to go what, seven to 21, 30 days exactly. before you just start getting like wastage, you know, and there's no need to age any further. Okay. So let's, let's talk though about aging individual cuts because I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet you've probably done it, but you haven't done it the dry aging way. You've done it with something called aspergillus oryzae. Is that true? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. The first time I ever heard about Koji was from the owner and founder of uh, Mamafuku. 
You know who I'm oh, talking about? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. David. And um, and it just, it just sort of just passed over the head. It wasn't a big deal. But he talked about experimenting it with different, you know, grains and so on and forth. And years passed, years passed. And then all of a sudden I get my hands on this book called Pure Charcuterie. <laughs> the, the Craft and Poetry of Curing Meats at Home. That's your book. And yeah. you have this little section dedicated specifically to Koji. And the minute I, I started reading about it, it, it dawned on me. I've heard about this before. But um, right. but it wasn't presented in such a way in which it made me think, I need to get down on this. But, but yeah, totally. you, you not only talked about koji, you talked about propagating it, you talked about harvesting it, you talked about how, what, what you could use it for, and then how to implement it in a particular field I'm interested in, which is charcuterie. We should just do a little background. Koji is a, it's a mold. It's a white mold that grows on the surface of anything you put it on. Most Normally, that's grains because it's a starch-modifying mold, so it likes to break down starch, and it's traditionally grown on rice or red beans or barley, and it is indigenous to China um, and then has been used widely in Japan for centuries to produce miso and soy sauce and you know all kinds of other fermented foods that you may be familiar with, but you don't realize that they depend on a mold for yeah. their production. Um, and then... More recently, koji has been adapted and used in all kinds of cooking um, in order because it has powerful enzymatic capabilities. So what happens is when it's cultured on the surface of a food, or it could be a carrot, it could be a pork chop, anything, um, then it starts to release amylase and protease, which are two very powerful enzymes for breaking down both sugars and protein. And so even if you've cultured the koji on a food product in a special environment that koji likes, you can take it out of that environment and the enzymes will continue to do their work. And so what they're doing is they're breaking big molecules down into smaller molecules to make way for regular fermentative processes to happen. The other thing they're doing is tenderizing and flavoring in and of themselves the food product with their own koji magic. So uh, pork chop or, a, or even a more traditionally tough cut of meat can be cultured with koji and you'll experience uh, greater tenderness and definitely that funky dry agey flavor that you might associate with with dry aged beef but it's actually coming from the surface mold that we call koji wow so we've we've seen the spike of people wanting to use koji on steaks for that prop yeah. for that specific process is that is there right. a is there a kind of a, a, a you know hard fast method on this is how it's done, or it's it's pretty loose? Um, well, I mean, it's just what you're going to need to do if you want to use it on meat or on anything is that you have to set up an environment for it, same as if you're making sauerkraut or making charcuterie. Um, Koji is an aerobic surface mold, so it has to have oxygen, um, and it thrives in pretty high temperatures, so we're talking like 80 to 86 or 7 degrees Fahrenheit and high humidity. Um, and so, you know, you've got to have some kind of environment. Some people are like um, using Fuji hydrators um, for this purpose. I have a box that was made out of foam board with a heat, incandescent heat bulb inside of it and a temperature controller that that's plugged into so I can set the temperature where I want it. And it's got a rack in there and I can put, I mean, I can koji a whole ham or I can put a steak on a rack and stick it in there. And what you're going to do is it only takes about 48 hours top, you know, maybe 36 to 48 hours. But you once you've inoculated the product and put it in the incubator, then what you're going to see is a flowering of the mold on the surface of the product. And at that point, you're, you know, if you're aging or creating an aged flavor and trying to tenderize something, you're pretty much done. In that period of time, you pull the steak out or whatever and cook it in a pan. And what you're going to get is a greater tenderization and a more complex flavor. I mean, one of the things that's amazing about koji is that it, it is in and of itself like an umami, um, a bearer of umami. So it's, it's going to create fullness in the mouth. And the other thing it does is it plays off of and amplifies sweetness, sourness, any other notes that are already in the food. So it takes the ordinary and makes everything more complex. Wow. Um, the other thing you can do, though, say, say you did put, um, say you made some salami and you put it in your koji incubator and you grow the koji on the outside of the salami, much like you would a penicillium mold. 
right? Um, mm -hmm. And then you can take that salami out of the koji incubator, hang it in your charcuterie cabinet. And because of the enzymes that koji is producing, you're going to ferment. You know, you're basically going to be fermenting while the koji is growing in the incubator because the temperature is pretty high. And then once you take it out and put it in your cabinet, you're getting quicker drying because of the powerful enzymes. Um, and so you can cure meat in sometimes a, a half to a third of the amount of time that you would using normal processes with the help of koji. Wow. Um, so it has a lot of really amazing applications. A lot of times people buy koji rice in order to produce some of the secondary ferments that you can make with koji, like shio or amazaki. There, there's a whole world of things that you can do with koji. And once you've got, I mean, once you've cultured koji on a grain like rice or barley or, or a bean or something, you can then take that koji rice or the koji rice that you've bought and then add it to more rice and, and incubate that. And you'll get like a salty probiotic rice porridge basically that we called shio and if you ferment it at a different temperature you'll get like a more sweet rice porridge and then those things can go into like you can use them as bread starters you can use them as marinades and brine you can make pickles with them and, wow um again like those those secondary ferments are going to be very enzymatically active and so they're going to tenderize the flavor and and you know take take your food even if you make a stir fry and you drizzle a little bit of shio koji over it at the end you're going to get flavors that pop more and you're going to get you know you're just going to get more complexity so you basically um, have like a salt then, substitute kind of yeah it's or a good. sugar uh, substitute depending on what you depending on which one you end up with yeah and there's people using it in that way my dad has cardiomyopathy um so he eats he can't eat salt um, like he used to. And so one of my projects is I'm developing a, like a very low salt bacon for him so that he can enjoy bacon again. And I'm, and the way I'm doing it is I'm working with different salt contents and then also Koji in order to produce, because Koji has an electromagnetic magnetic charge, just like salt does. So it can draw water out of meat the way we endeavor to, when we're trying to preserve it. And that's like a whole nother level of charcuterie instruction we don't have time for, but like, the implications of that are really huge because it means that people who are on low salt diets and even low sugar diets, like that, that the amount of salt that we require to cure meats is maybe can be reduced if we're, if we're working with Koji because Koji also has the ability to alter the water activity in the meat product. Wow. So it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. I mean, we're, we're barely scratching the surface at this point. With, well, that's what it, with, that's what it sounds what like. I mean, it just sounds like there's an yeah. entire world that's left to be discovered. You 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 mentioned putting koji on a piece of steak and then putting it in a, in a eighty to ninety degree ferment box for two days. This is uncured steak, right? Or pork yeah, or it's chicken? A raw... Yeah. The first time I did it, it as um, <laughs> what a trip. The first time I did it, I was for sure that it was going to rot. I, I put in a five pound pork loin mm -hmm. into an incubator with koji on it, and I I was like, man, this is going to spoil. Like, I, I can't believe I'm doing this, you know? And then I walked away from it, you know, checked on it every once in a while. When I finally was ready to open the lid and, like, really pull it out of there, I was kind of scared, you know, but I opened the lid and it smelled like a wildflower meadow. <laughs> I mean, like, Koji just has this, like, flowery, sweet, amazing aroma to it. And, I mean, I, I think I had cured the Lomo with, I think there's a recipe in the book for it. It's this Chinese five spice and salt. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. And I was afraid. I was like, oh, man, it smells all flowery. Like, I wonder if you'll be able to taste the five spice anymore. Like, is it just going to taste like this koji stuff? Then I went in, hung it in my cabinet, cured it. And, man, the koji just brought out the flavor of the pork and of the five spice and everything that I had added. And it was so amazing. It was like, it, it seemed magical to me almost. Wow. You know, wow. the first time I did it. And I took it to a food show and was feeding it to chefs, and they were like, I don't even know what I'm eating right now. Like, it's so complex. Like, I can't even, like, how can I buy this? Like, what, you know, this is, like, the most incredible thing I've ever eaten. You know? That's so it's, so it's someone definitely... doesn't someone doesn't need to worry if, if they take, so, but that was, a, that was a cured piece of loin, right? Yes, yes. It was All right, so if somebody fire. takes a, if someone takes a loin, uh, excuse me, if someone takes a pork chop, puts koji on yeah. it, uncured, because they want to have pork yeah. chops, can they go through the same process? Yes, they can. The, at that point, what they'll be doing is just tenderizing and producing like the aged flavor when they go to cook it. I mean, wow. Jeremy, the guy who I've like, he's very open source and he's sort of like a leader in, in using koji and culinary um, applications in Ohio. 
he's the one who kind of walked me through some of this and he's grown in on scallops. You know, talk about something that you consider highly perishable, like putting a piece of fresh fish in a koji incubator and culturing it and then taking it out and cooking it, you know. That's incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Listen, Meredith, I know you're short on time. If somebody wants to know how to get to how to get to your classes, can they go to your website? Yes. So okay. Mayor Lee Food is my web handle. Hopefully you'll put it up where they can see it visually. But I'm doing two-day intensive immersions into charcuterie all over the country. I'm also booking for next year. So if people are interested in having me in their home kitchen or in their commercial kitchen or whatever, teaching um, this stuff, um, please, you know, drop me a line um, and and check out my books because they're they're definitely a way for people to just like hit the ground running with, with some of these principles from homesteading all the way to making salamis. Absolutely. The Ethical Meat Handbook and Pure Charcuterie, the craft and poetry curing meats at home, and they cover a ton of information. And so I want to thank you for your time, Meredith. Thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. Hey, have fun with Koji. I am, and I'll have to drop you a line let you know how it goes. Sounds good. I can't wait to hear Thanks it. Thanks a lot, Meredith. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.